Hello, you're welcome to my channel. My name is Ayo DJ Matulipo, and I'm a researcher based in the UK. On this channel, I share general tips for thriving during a PhD program. And in this video, I'll be continuing a series that I started where I invite foreign PhD students or people who have finished their PhDs to share about their academic journey and their tips for thriving during a PhD program and general career advice. So today I have a guest a PhD student in pharmaceutical health outcomes and policy at the University of Houston. So without further ado, I'll allow her to introduce herself and then we'll start the conversation. Hello, Tari. Welcome to my channel and thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Yes. Hi, Ayo. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, my name is Tari. Tari Latte Temedi Asogwa is the full name, but most people call me Tari. Um, I'm a PhD student in the Pharmaceutical Health Outcomes and Policy Department at the University of Houston. That is within the College of Pharmacy. Um, I have a diverse academic background. I earned my Bachelor of Pharmacy from Niger Delta University in Nigeria. Um, I went further to do a master's in clinical pharmacy at Nandi Azikawe University. Then I converted my from a B farm to farm D at the <laughs> Uniben University of Benin, all from Nigeria. And um, before joining the University of Houston, I used to lecture in University of Portaco, the College of Pharmacy. I used to lecture in clinical pharmacy and pharmacy management department. Um, um, here I'm honored to be a recipient of the graduate tuition fellowship and the prestigious presidential fellowship award, which fully funds my current program. And I'm excited to be here to share my experience and insights with you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for the nice introduction. So, from um, looking at your background, because I've looked at your LinkedIn and all of that, you have quite a diverse experience. So that from clinical practice, now moving into lecturing, and then now the PhD. So, how did you make that transition? Like, why, why research? Oh well, I have always been someone who is passionate about research. I'm a very curious person, so. You know, from doing clinical pharmacy, actually my my passion grew when I stayed in clinical practice for a very long time. I was in the hospital, so I saw that there were lots of, you know, issues in terms of policies not in place, things like antibiotic misuse. I and I did some <laughs> antibiotic stuff some years yeah. back you know we are both like antibiotic stewards uh, you know i saw that some of the issues that we have in the uh, in nigeria in the clinical setting it's not just it's not just um because people want to do what they want to do but there are no strict policies guiding these things and we see that they adversely affect patients outcomes so when i saw all of these problems i was trying to Oh, how do I be part of the solution, you know? And I started to research and I saw that there's a program like Health Outcomes and Policy and it resonated with my passion. So I'm like, okay, I'd like to go deep into this. So I, you know, and more so as a lecturer, you know, that is a natural progression yeah. in your yeah your academic um career so i had a master's already of course i want to progress so i came in here and based on my clinical experience i developed passion so that brought me into this program of health outcomes and policy okay okay so i want to unpack that a bit because for me like when i was applying for my phd i remember i was speaking to a couple of people and yeah, my focus there was antimicrobial stewardship. I remember someone said to me, like, why don't you check out health outcomes and policy? And I just I just looked at it briefly and I was like, I don't understand what it's about. And I'm not sure I'm interested. So I think looking at your experience, I was I started to get even more interested. I remember when someone mentioned this to me. So I wanted to, I was going to ask, like, when you looked at all other PhD programs, like what was so specific about health outcomes and policy that you really wanted to do it? Well, I just felt like it was all encompassing like all outcomes and policy touches on different aspects of health the outcome the patients 
you know, derived from use of medication or whatever intervention that has been provided by the um, caregivers, you know. And also, it is somewhat multidisciplinary because we do things that relates to economics, like cost of drugs. We do things related to access to health care. We do things related to the quality of the pharmaceutical care that has been provided mm. in the clinical setting. You know, we do things related to social and behavioral aspect of clinical practice or pharmacy practice. We do pharmacoeconomics, trying to make sure we use as the lowest possible cost to achieve the best possible outcome those kind of things and also about organizations you know assessing technologies like technological assessments to find out how the economic value is this drug really providing enough value for the amount you know those kind of things so that cuts across like we're checking outcomes and then we'll be able to be informed to make policy or provide recommendation that can affect a change in policy. Overall, it would improve the patient's outcomes and the quality of life. So it really resonated with the overall picture I had. And I was like, whoa, that's the perfect program. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like a very diverse and robust program we are looking at different out uh, aspects of everything basically the health economics be it, the social and behavior so linking to that now so what was the program like how has it been structured so um what year are you in and what has the journey been like so far okay i'm currently in my third year spring semester that second semester um it's been hectic but <laughs> wonderful <laughs> So when I see people like you, the Dr. Inei, that did a PhD in UK, and then you guys are just like going into your research, like from the beginning, I think. <laughs> yeah. But when I came here, in my mind, I'm going to do research. Ah, I found myself in the classroom again. <laughs> Coursework, like from scratch, mm -hmm. you know. But it's really, really beautiful because honestly... Huh. though i mean pharmacy and you know i know all of this pharmaceutical stuff this field is kind of different in mm -hmm. terms of this is research now right it's not clinical practice that you just you know so we did a very rigorous uh coursework in my first year and second year mm -hmm. so during the first year the coursework um first and second year we do the compulsory they call them core causes for the program. We have about nine core causes. Mm -hmm. So you do that. Yeah. <laughs> so it's spread to four semesters. Mm -hmm. These are like 10 units for the first semester, nine credit units, you know, nine, nine, 10, like that. So, and then you can take electives as well. But for each semester, because I am an international student, you need to take at least nine credit hours. So um, for my kind of program, it might be different from other programs. You, you come in, you may not have an advisor yet. Oh. So the first, yes, some people reached out to faculties to say, oh, I would like to work with you going through their profile. For me, I didn't really reach out because I wasn't sure really. Like, I just mm -hmm. wanted to get in to know who I can really work with. So thankfully, the way my program is structured, you just do an initial rotation in your first year to just get to know who these um, professors are, what they are doing, just mm -hmm. go around and meet all of them. And then the second semester, um, yeah you complete that initial rotation then for the summer you do an intensive rotation maybe with two or three faculties after which you will choose somebody you would work with throughout the program yeah then for the second year you complete your coursework and then in summer you can either do internship or mm -hmm. you take classes either ways 
then at the beginning of the third year that is fall semester you have to take the comprehensive exams oh, okay. which is like your qualifying exams without that exam you cannot move forward in the okay. PhD program yeah so after completing that exam you take all the courses you've learned for the first two years you know i think it's it's not i think i know it's it's like a knowledge check they just want to be sure that all the concepts you've learned over the period you have a good understanding because that will guide you to be able to carry out your dissertation so for instance if you don't understand research methods and things mm. like that you won't be able to effectively do your dissertation so that is like the crossroad you have to cross over before you can even say oh i am beginning my proposal mm. it might be different for, for other schools so after that you do your proposal you set up your committee you know then you take two other exams called um, the area of emphasis exam and the dissertation proposal defense after which if you pass those ones you just keep working with your committee and then you can do internships with pharma companies or wherever and then once you're done you fix your defense and um if they are satisfied with everything you graduate they are what you did degree <laughs> So from what I'm getting now, so it's about roughly two years of um, the first work for two, three years, and then two years of research. So like almost it's like five, five years altogether. Yeah. Five years. <laughs> yeah, it's five years altogether. First two years are like core course work. From the third to the fifth, you are doing electives plus oh. your dissertation and okay. all that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's definitely different from the UK because for the UK, <laughs> from day one, you go straight into your research and you can do, um, you can do all that. Call it's more like CPDs, professional development or courses you want to do along the journey. So you can do courses on research methods, writing, mm -hmm. critical review of research, literature reviews. So you do that alongside your, your, your research basically, and especially mm -hmm. for like. Um, like my uni and most unis in the first year we do an upgrade which is almost similar to the qualifying exam but definitely not as intense in terms of we're not doing any coursework or exams but you, you can, you're able to do all that all that all those courses but they're not a prerequisite but you submit a report at the end of the nine to twelfth month you do a mini viva and then you upgrade and continue into your second year so yeah it's, it's the uh, systems are different and i guess so uh, probably in north america thing because the same thing they do in i guess in canada and stuff like that. canada wow yeah Interesting. So, <laughs> i can imagine so um in terms of now um i just wanted to think about in terms of when you are applying for the phd like is there any particular reason why you chose your current university or you um, apply to other programs and why did you pick this one well um, i really like houston first because of the weather <laughs> <laughs> so why i picked the program our program is really a strong program in terms of um the what the content of the program mm -hmm. it has you know like so all the things, all of these things, there are different faculties that do them, like access, behavioral. When I went through the curriculum, it was like, hmm, like, and I'm knowledge driven. So I'm like, huh, I can't wait to consume <laughs> all of this content. And it was just, I was just excited. Like I went through different programs, but ultimately I had applied to three schools at the time i applied to university of houston i got in two schools but university of houston was the first to reach out to me the <laughs> other one came really late i don't know why they had such delays but i took the offer i liked the place like at least i didn't have to worry much i don't tolerate cold <laughs> So he still was more or less like Nigerian weather, sort of. Okay. So, yeah, I didn't bother to switch when I got the other offer. Okay. Okay. 
So thinking now about um, funding, I know you mentioned in the beginning the funding that you have, but I just wanted to touch on it so maybe people in case they are wondering like the way the funding is in the US because what I used to think or maybe what my own, I don't know if that's what it is, but I know that um, maybe there's funding, but I know most people have to do like teaching assistantships or research assistantships and that's where your funding comes from. I don't know if I'm right. So I don't, mm -hmm. I just, if you can just share a bit <laughs> about how the funding is structured and what things you're required to do or not. Okay. Um, yeah, so my funding is um, basically through like research. I am a teaching assistant, so there are two ways. Okay. I'm a graduate teaching assistant. There's also the graduate research assistant. So you can be a TA, teaching assistant, or an RA. Mm. So at the initial time, we were all TAs, you know. So that's where our funding come from, like... Mm you have the graduate tuition fellowship then some people like the presidential fellowship award i was talking about is mm. it's um another kind of award like it gives you additional some percentage it adds to your funding so that one it's like it's quite competitive like not everybody gets it but uh, you know some persons get it so i was on those two do i say types of funding but the presidential fellowship award you can only renew it two times oh. so afterwards your normal gta just continues oh. so you are required to work with the school you're like an employee like student worker kind of thing you oh work with the department you assist professors you braid you proctor exams you know you um for the research assistant they assist the professors to do whatever research they are doing mm -hmm. write papers grants um proposals whatever they want you to do mm -hmm. you just assist them then there is also that's like basically what the tara does okay. our program um fortunately is like automatically if you get in they make these things available you don't have to like submit a separate application mm -hmm. for yes but not every school is like that there are some schools you get the admission and then you go ahead and apply for the fellowships and you know scholarships mm -hmm. and all that but as they made it really um easy for us which i'm grateful for <laughs> at least you reduce the number of applications so they just screen maybe they take the most competitive application and then on our behalf apply to these scholarships okay. and then yes yes but how is it juggling everything with ta your mm. research the coursework because <laughs> i'm just thinking now like <laughs> and you know that that's it's where your funding is coming from <laughs> and so it's like exactly. i'm having to do this <laughs> exactly like you see this our call was meant to be earlier but yeah ta duties you know <laughs> cut in between and i had to get to school uh, it is what it is <laughs> yeah we had to just juggle learn how to balance you know i mean it's your responsibility you cannot be irresponsible anyways but with your studies with the ta duties or your ra duties so it's just you must learn how to multitask and manage your time and all that. Yeah. 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 It sounds like you have a very intense and also interesting experience. So I just want to talk now uh, about um, the skills that you've gained so far in this PhD program, Health Outcomes and Policy, because I know that from what you said, the different um, areas, it sounds like you have a very, very strong skill set now. So can you just touch a bit on some of the skills that you've gained and what you've learned so far? Mm, if there's one thing i've learned is um i've not mastered it i wouldn't say i'm a master of it but time management okay time management i mean that is like overall but if you want to talk about like core skills like mm -hmm. research research skills my research skills have tremendously improved prior to this time you know i score myself a researcher <laughs> <laughs> 
I do clinical research, public health research, you know, all this clinical pharmacy stuff, but this was the main research <laughs> coming here. I'm like, what is big data? What is? <laughs> so it was really um, very challenging initially. Mm-hmm. I am not a lover of statistics like that, but a program is really stat heavy. Mm. And coding as well like programming so we do programming with some statistical softwares like sas sas is the major thing we use to analyze our data there are others like stata you know our but we are heavy on stat but i i have some good level of um stata skills in terms of data analysis but i use stat very well SAS very well. Yeah, so those data analytics skills, it's um really fascinating the things you can do with data, you know, cleaning up those data, picking up very messy data and then trying to make sense out of it. And you know, presentation skills as well, because we are <laughs> we are meant to present every now and then, mm. you know. So if there's one thing the PhD will teach you is like your public speaking. Even if you are shy or whatever, you must do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So automatically you just get more and more comfortable talking, you know, and teaching, presenting. Also my teaching skills, because like the last semester I took a teaching practicum. That was my first time ever like teaching the classroom. <laughs> <laughs> Like I was in charge of the lecture. I assist, but it was my first time. I was quite nervous. I'm like, guys, I've never taught in the U S system. <laughs> I've never taught in the U S system before. So mm, don't expect too much, but anyhow, let's see how it goes. But it turned out really well. And, um, yeah. So those are some of the skills over time. I, have built and also critical thinking critical thinking skills it's 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 amazing like it just makes you force you to enter that zone of thinking and creating stuff it's fascinating it makes your brain sharp <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah Okay, so I'm really coming to the end of the conversation, and um, my next question is around the um, career um, options available to a person with a PhD in health and come to success. So I'm imagining that from your program, because of our diversities and all the different areas, you already have a sense of what the career path is like after, and I'm sure people go in different directions. So can you just share a bit about the career options available? Okay, um, because our field is really diverse, I see graduates in different areas. Some people go to academia. It's also common with the graduates of U of H, like University of Houston, but they are mostly in industry, pharmaceutical industry. But I've also seen alumni in like government and policy (laughs) research, you know, there was one that when we had one of those programs, he said he he does research for the U.S. election. I'm wow. like, yeah. <laughs> you know, so these things wow. we learn, it's, it's so beautiful that you can apply them anywhere. You know, the way we learn, okay, interrupted time series, for instance, I'm not being too technical. It's just like, oh, one policy was um created now what what is the effect of this policy versus when the policy wasn't there so you know you can apply it to voting how is this thing affecting the pattern of voting compared to other years or something you know it's really fascinating so there are people in government and policy research as well there are people in um, pharmaceutical like i said industry or medical device industry that's a big thing there are many device companies that are like evolving these days then there are people in consulting Mm -hmm. you know they become consultant advising healthcare organizations or government agencies for issues related to outcomes research and things like that then we have people in public health 
mm. you know, healthcare organizations. And then there are people, the people who are really, really interested in the real coding analysis. <laughs> I'm not, that's not my <laughs> area. <laughs> So people in data science or analytics, you know, are also there. And um, even clinical research or like um, medical science liaison. There are different uh, graduates are like scattered everywhere. Yeah. So for me, I think the most important thing is the skill set that you gather while doing the phd it can be applied virtually anywhere so that's the beauty of you know doing something like a phd it it pays off at the end yeah, mm. Those. yeah. So, so thank you so much for sharing so far it's been quite insightful and very engaging so far so i wanted to ask uh, the final question and uh, that's about mm. um, based on your experience so far now do you have any general advice that you want to share to Maybe PhD students in general or PhD students wanting to do the kind of program you're doing. Just any general tips that you have. Yeah, um, I'll just say generally, I mean, people maybe who are in their PhD, time management is very crucial. Um, networking. <laughs> we hear this networking thing. I didn't know how uh, it is a very important. I think it's 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 not been emphasized. It's been emphasized, but I think some people take, some of us take it with some bit of levity, like, okay, network, it's something that is really, really important. I mean, during your PhD, you should mm -hmm. network a lot. You know, it helps, it helps, even during and after, you know, for jobs and all of that. And then self-care, something I really must emphasize. A lot of PhDs, uh, it's a lot of work so you know the tendency to neglect oneself it's there it's high so it's important to have a self-care goal as much as you have your academic goal and it's hard but try to balance don't be all into oh let me get this done you burn out and when you're burnt out you can't really make progress so at every point in time you know, it's good to have that balance. And then set clear goals. There are many resources available in the campus and you only have access when you're here. So it's good to take advantage of those resources. And um, mentors, seek mentors, you know, who can provide guidance through the journey. And <clears throat> talking about um, support system as well. I can't overemphasize the importance of support system. It could be spiritual support, mental support, academic support. Just, you know, surround yourself, yourself with people that can support you. It's easy to fall out of passion with what you're doing mm. if you don't have support system. And, you know, the stressors are multifaceted. So you need to, you know, have different support system to be able to be Goal and still go through the program without breaking down. Um, take care of your mental health, your physical health, you know, you know, even if you're struggling, just it's a very stressful journey. It's just important to prioritize self-care. I can't overemphasize that. And um, just keep keep abreast with what's going on in your field, attend conferences, meet people, network, no what is happening don't just be focused on your research <laughs> really yeah you know what is happening out in the outer world as well so that's just it yeah yeah and i'll add finally to that because you're doing it a lot use linkedin <laughs> yes please linkedin <laughs> is your go-to social media app especially as a phd student you have a lot of professionals there so yeah i just started using it and um, i've gotten amazing connections from there <laughs> yeah and it's all part of networking anyways <laughs> right it is it is mm -hmm. yeah okay thank you so much thank you so much Tarila, for your time thank you for um sharing your insights and i'm sure people will learn a lot from this i'm so grateful and thank you to our 
audience also for listening in if you enjoyed this video you can give it a like and subscribe to my channel and i'll see you in my next video thank you thank you for having me please subscribe guys subscribe <laughs> thank you take bye. care bye bye